everybody is from. And I'm actually filling in for Sarah Eustace, who's also on our academic research team. Uh, she couldn't make it today. And uh, so I'm taking over for her. So I, I want to make this informal. Um, we have an academic research team. We also have a, a research team on industry and member research. And they're the ones who send out all those surveys, such as the global coaching study, the consumer awareness survey, and so forth. Um, my team, we do more of the academic style research. That's why we call ourselves academic research. And we do more of the, um, I, I hesitate to use the word rigorous, but the kinds of studies that would show up in academic journals uh, and books. And so we have a particular focus in that direction. We also focus a lot on the core competencies and, and we headed up the team coaching competency work so that's a very long and involved process. Um, we're doing a lot of studies right now on MCC coaching and um, several other things, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. So I wanna give you a flavor for research and what it entails. And I wanna leave time you know, at different points for, uh, for Q and A. Um, so let's go ahead and get into that. Um, so the, what, what I want to follow this agenda is about what research is about and the basics, the elements of it, the types, and then a little bit about our research. And I'm going to give you some research resources that you can go to one of which you're seeing on the screen. <laughs> so uh, first thing, um, how many people do we have? Should we do a breakout or should we just have a discussion here, Lily? You, we have around 12 people with you, so 11 people, nine without DNA. Okay, well, how about if we maybe break into five groups randomly? So it'd be like four, is that okay? And how much time do you want? Uh, let's give people three minutes. Okay. Thank so here's you. the question, what comes to mind when you hear the term research? Be one of the groups, David? Pardon? You, you want to be one of the groups or not? No, I wasn't going to. So poor Mauricio's on his own. And you have some kind of warble on your computer, Damien? Oh, you can put, can you pause recording? Okay. Okay, so let's let's hear a few of the of the things that people felt research was about. I, I can tell you about what our group and then you can jump in um, if I miss something, Mary and Lynn. We said, somebody said, time, commitment, intelligence, theory. Then someone else said, inquiry, not knowing, curiosity, data. And then the third person, uh, said research question first, structure, citing sources. Um, and then we talked about uh, not pushing the data and all this and, and where to get all these citations. So we went from, wow. from conducts and behaviors to the theory, to the, to the methodology. Am I missing okay. something? <laughs> That's excellent, Susie, in fact. You, get, you, act, you guys actually answered the next question, but I'm not going to tell you what that question was. <laughs> yeah. So um, let me share my screen again. So this is a succinct idea of what research is. This is from uh, the Wikipedia page. And it's a creative and systemic work undertaken to increase the stock of knowledge. So that's the, the fundamental thing to remember is that you're trying to, to increase the you know, some people talk about the body of knowledge. I call it the stream of knowledge because um, it's actually a stream of data and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, our, <clears throat> at ICF, we have a little bit more elaborate of a definition, um, but that's not super important and you can, you can find that on the website. So um, 
what, I, let's not do a breakout for this one, but what do you think is the most important element in terms of research? And, and Susie mentioned it. Yeah, it's actually what Lynn, yeah. I was gonna say, first thing came to my mind was rigor. But okay. I, that wasn't in the definition. <laughs> well, no, let's, let's call that validity of the methodology. Mm -hmm. Knowing what we want to research. Yes, yes. So, um, oops, your research question. So when you're doing a PhD, you'll, you'll have to identify succinctly and clearly, what is your research question? And I see this all the time. I'm a, an editor for an academic journal, a consulting psychology journal, one of the associate editors. And I frequently see this um, where people don't define clearly what it is that their research is about or what are the elements, and then they don't clearly state what the research question is. So they go through, you know, as Michelle mentioned, all this rigor, all this methodology, but it's not really clear all the time what they're researching. So that's kind of the beginning is, is what your research question is. Okay, so let's talk about the different elements. And, and Susie, you mentioned some of those. And the first thing you do is you wanna understand what exists. So that's what's called the literature review. And as you do a literature review, one of the most important things, and notice I've bolded it and I have put asterisks around this, and that is to find out what happened after a study. I'll give you an example. Barbara Fredrickson, anybody heard of her? Yeah, yeah, a few of you. Okay, uh, positivity ratio. Anybody know that one? Yeah, okay. So there's this famous paper by Barbara Fredrickson and Lasada, and they came out with this positivity ratio of number of positive comments versus negative comments and what it took to kind of tip the scales toward um, high performance. And they said it was like 3.11. And I remember reading this paper thinking, why did you say 3.11? Why can't you just say three, roughly three? So this paper was around for a long time, highly cited. Some statistical folks got in there and said, well, wait a minute, it's not really 3.11. And, and they, they did this, these studies and, and showed why it wasn't 3.11. And in the end, um, Barbara, she kind of walked away from the paper and she said, I'm not going to defend it. But in the same journal uh, as that paper refuting it, she had another paper and she said, okay, fine, let's walk away from this data, but here's some new data. And by the way, the number's still around three. So when I see that Losada and Fredrickson paper cited without citing the follow-on research that says, okay, you know, there's, there's additional stuff here, then I know they haven't done a good literature review. I'll give you another example. I saw in a, in a PhD dissertation, somebody talked about Daniel Goleman as the father of emotional intelligence. And, I'm, and um, for those of you who've been in that field, um, Mayor Caruso and Salove, about five years before, Goldman came out with his book, they were the ones who really um, talked about this concept of emotional intelligence. So a, a good literature review to understand what's already out there is extremely important because that's your foundation, that's your base, and you're gonna be building on top of that. So then the question is, what are you, what are you going to study? And this is where this idea of the, the crisp description of, of what are the constructs that you're going to be involving and the one, what, what is your research question? That needs to be clear, it needs to be distinct. What do you wanna learn from your study? And then as, as Michelle pointed out, it's so important is the study design and the methodology that you use. And a lot of times I will go to the methodology section of a paper first um, because I wanna see what, what they did and, and that kind of gives me an indication 
of how good the paper might be. I'll give you an example here. There was a paper that used graduate students as coaching subject matter experts or SMEs. How long had these, how long and how much had these graduate students coached? Well, to me, that was kind of a fundamental flaw. So then what did you learn from your study? How is it important to the field? Because as I talked about, research is expanding the field. And what additional research might evolve? So that's a future research section that you frequently see. Also importantly, didn't put it on the chart, but also very important is limitations. What are the limitations to your study? Because every study has limitations and I could speak for a long time about that. Um, so let's talk about the, some of the, the types of uh, research that are out there. So I talked about the department that I have, the academic research team, and then there's also commercial research, which is more along the lines of what the member and industry research team at ICF uses. So commercial research is out to answer a business question, and there may not be as much rigor around the questions because they don't, they don't really need to. I've done that work, um, so I understand it fairly well. But with academic research, you're trying to add to the knowledge and it's gonna, it's gonna get more scrutiny than commercial research will be. Uh, oftentimes, academic research is peer reviewed and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And it's, it's meant to be more robust uh, in terms of content validity, there are many different types of validity. And academic research is typically either qualitative, meaning it's about words, it's about what I call the richness and texture, um, or it's quantitative and it's about numbers that might be from a, a survey, for example. So I just mentioned these two types of, of uh, research, qualitative and quantitative, and quantitative, you're, you're exploring something. So you're, you're trying to understand what it's, what it's about. So you're trying to get some insights, what's the context? You know, I often use the term, is it, are you studying a bread box? Or are you studying a refrigerator? How big is this, okay? What is it, do you open it up? Is it cold or is it warm? You know, so, so that tells you a lot of detail, a lot of richness of, of what's in there. With, with quantitative studies, you're mainly doing surveys. You might be testing hypotheses and theories and um, replicability is important where you may do one study and somebody else may repeat your study and see if they can get the same answer. And so that, that, can, be, that can be really important too. So another way to look at this, at these two methods of qualitative versus quantitative is how you gather the data. And with qualitative, you typically gather data with interviews, with focus groups. You can do some case studies. So case studies are basically fewer in number, um, but they don't go into quite as much depth and you don't get the, the breadth. You can also do qualitative studies with surveys using open-ended questions so that you can compare that with quantitative where you're doing surveys with multi-choice questions and then, and then you're doing statistics on those. You could also do experimental studies and quantitative and those might be about observations. So you can also mix these methods and that I, I'm a firm believer in mixed method studies because that gives you the advantages of both. So for example, with the managers and leaders study that we did that we published in, in Consulting Psychology Journal, we started out with a qualitative study. And what we did was we went to curriculum developers of training programs for managers and leaders and how they use coaching skills. And we asked them, what do you teach? What is important here? You know, at the end of the interviews, we almost always ask, what did we not ask? that we should be asking. So you can start out with qualitative to understand, and here's my thing about the bread box or the refrigerator, 
and, and you're trying to understand the, the texture of it, you can move, after you found that qualitative information, you can move into quantitative, and then you can get some numbers to find out what's important, what's not important, what things are connected to what. And then if you want to, you can go back into the qualitative mode and say, oh, we need to explore this further and then dive into a, a very specific uh, topic area. So I'm gonna stop here and see what questions you might have at this moment. I have a comment, uh, Joel, that uh, we, we really, we have been teaching different programs and one, if one of the exercises is for people to come up at the end of the program with a research project. And sometimes people don't know where to start. How, how, what, what is the first place to start? So I think that it, it's good to know that for, for what I'm hearing, and we have been talking a little bit about that, but it's good to hear from you that being clear about what is the research question in the first place is, I wanna be sure that that is correct. <laughs> that starting with a uh, question that people need to think and spend time in coming up with a question that they will be researching. And sometimes we don't hear clarity around that. So will you say that that is the first place to look at? Um, is that a question for me, Damien? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, what are the, what are the constructs that you're studying? If you're studying mindfulness, what's your definition of mindfulness? What is the literature? What are the facets of mindfulness that other people, uh, Ruth Baer and other, other folks have, have uh, come up with? And then what is it that you want to learn about mindfulness, for example, and maybe how mindfulness might be related to coaching? So um, yeah, to be very distinct and very clear, uh, and, and have really good definitions. Um, I think that's, that's a really good place to start. Lynn? Yeah, I was also thinking about the importance of declaring uh, what you think or what you believe going into the research. So you can put that aside because it's we usually come in with some kind of a sense of what might come out of the research. And if we don't sort of honestly uh, declare to ourselves where those biases might be or what we're bringing in terms of our own experience that can impact the quality of the research. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it can influence it positively or negatively, right? <laughs> because the idea is the, the hope is that you have a hunch of what the research is going to show you and therefore you'll say, okay, I think this is important managers and leaders using coaching skills. Our hunch was that that would be related to uh, engagement. It would be related to working alliance and it would be related to intention to quit. And indeed we found very strong correlations there. So um, it's good to have that. But on the negative side, you can have something that would block. Uh, you might say, oh, I don't think that's important. And you might, you might miss something. So yeah, really good point. Or I'm thinking you might design the research to find the results that you want to find. <laughs> and it's not as clean. Confirmation bias, yes. Yes, very true. Yeah, we do that for us as homo sapiens. We do that all the time. Yeah, so there's two points that I have noticed in research. One is the kind of questions that are being asked, and it speaks a little to what Lynn was saying is, whatever our question is and whatever our beliefs are, we tailor the question to suit us rather than keep them open and um, unbiased. So I see this bias creep coming into the questions being asked. And I think like, oh, that's an interesting question to ask, given your question. And the other was about the references we use that you you quoted the emotional intelligence. That's, that's a great point because I just finished a peer review of a journal article where I thought, this is kind of interesting. They didn't refer to certain people in the industry where they're big uh they are the original founders thought leaders in this topic i think it was systemic and it was like this is kind of interesting that they totally disregarded some big names in the industry and what's that all about because that right away told me this research may this paper may not be as sound as it could have been yeah yeah and i'll see that as a reviewer as well um, that they miss, they miss people 
uh, or they miss studies a lot. And that's where the value of the peer review comes in to me, I think. It's very big points. Um, what else? Anything else? Okay, well, let's move on. Um, let's just say one brief comment before we move on. Is mm -hmm. that usually after the first question that is, okay, how do we start? Is okay having a good, effective, I am being practical here in terms of people having to do some research projects. The second question that usually comes is how, how many, for to do qualitative studies, because most of the participants are going to be uh, involved in qualitative studies and quantitative because of many different reasons. But people ask, okay, if I'm going to be doing interviews, how many? If I am going to be doing a, um, uh, like a focus group, how many? So how do you answer that question? <laughs> oh, I don't like those questions, Dan. <laughs> I get those <laughs> questions. People like that time. question not to us, so we need to answer them. Yeah. So um, at the extreme low end, there's a process called interpretative phenomenological analysis. Uh, Jonathan A. Smith in the UK is um, one of the developers of that particular uh, technique. And there you're looking at a homogenous sample. And it, he, he calls a purposive, uh, purposeful sample. And there, you know, we did a study with him uh, that was like eight people. And that's okay because you're, you're stating that it's not meant to be a broad sample, but you're trying to find the meaning that people get from whatever the topic is. And so that's like the extreme low end. If you get into more grounded theory kind of analyses in, in terms of qualitative research, um, you kind of see numbers 25, 30 kind of range. Um, there, are, there are formulas to determine that. Um, there, I, I'm not a big fan of those formulas. That's one way. Another way is you can use the uh, technique what's called saturation, which I have used quite a bit. And that is, as you're interviewing people, you look for, you code, um, you're looking for the themes for each of the, through, uh, through the interviews, and you put down codes for in each of those interviews. For me, if I get three interviews in a row with no new codes, then I figure I've probably reached the point of saturation. And then you can probably quit. And to me, that's better than a formula. So, um, so, so that's on the qualitative side. On the quantitative side, I like to see a minimum of at least 100. Um, you know, you get up into 300 kind of range and then you're starting to, to look pretty good. When you start getting over 1,000, that can be problematic because now everything can start to be statistically significant. And that's problematic on the other end. So at that point, you can start looking at splitting your, your samples. Does that answer your question, Damien? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that because uh, we got that question a lot. Okay, if I'm going to be doing interviews uh, for this research project, how many do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And as you said, I have heard people who said, okay, at least 10, I heard, like, for example, Natalia uh, de Esteban, who I don't know if you met her from Spain, she did the research mm -hmm. on supervision, mm -hmm. and she, I think, interviewed, if I am not wrong, only six people, mm -hmm. and that was her master thesis, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so well, I could go on about that, but I, I won't, I'll, I'll spare you my, my speech. Okay, um, so let's talk about peer review. So what Lily was talking about, was reviewing for, um, I assume it was a, a journal article. Um, when, when an article comes into consulting psychology journal or any journal, um, there's a question about, about what to do with it. And if you, um, at the very bottom, you'll see this is what the normal process is. Somebody will submit a manuscript. And then um, at, uh, Consulting Psychology Journal, we have a two-tier system. So we have a main editor and Ken Nowak is, is the main editor. And then there are three of us as associate editors. So Ken can look at it and he can say, eh, that this doesn't fit our audience or it doesn't um, have sufficient rigor. And then if he, but if he says, no, I think this might be okay, it would come to one of us three associate editors and then we will scrutinize it further 
and then we can reject it. It's called a desk reject, uh, or we can send it out to, for review. And that's what Lily was talking about doing. And then so we have people who are, who are um, sufficiently skilled in the field. They've, they've published sufficiently. They understand the concepts of what needs uh, a good research paper needs to be. And then we'll send it out. Generally, you'll get two reviews. They'll be blind, so they don't know who the author is. And they may reject, they, they may suggest rejecting the manuscript, or they may suggest uh, revise and resubmit with, um, with uh, changes that they feel are necessary. And then that comes back to the editor generally, or the associate editor. Associate editor makes a decision, goes in our case to the regular editor, and then it goes to the author and says, okay, um, we like what you got, but here's some changes that, that we feel need to be made. And then um, if they revise, uh, they always have an option to just not come back, but if they revise and resubmit, then we generally go out for a review again. Um, there are times when I'll look at it and I'll say, yeah, this looks pretty good and, and we can move on to the publish phase. So that's probably the top is the peer reviewed journals. Now, um, the drawback is that those are only as good as, as the reviewers. So if you have some reviewers who aren't as well steeped in the field as they should be, then you know some things can get through that, that probably shouldn't get through. So the hierarchy of the literature, and it, this is purely Joel's opinion, but um, peer reviewed journal articles are probably the top um, and then there's a hierarchy within peer reviewed journals, and I won't go into that. Um, academic books are, I say, sort of peer reviewed because they will be reviewed by peers, but not probably not to the rigor that a journal will be. And then there are technical reports that, for example, as ICF will do, will put out technical reports because they're so focused. In, in ICF, say, core competencies that uh, they're not as applicable to the, to the wider audience. So uh, that's a technical report as opposed to a white paper, where a white paper is not nearly as technical. Um, and I've kind of put on the same line here, reports, popular press articles. And again, these, these aren't going to have show like a lot of correlations or statistical significance, a lot of that kind of stuff. And then really kind of the, the bottom, uh, what is called gray literature, and I would even call white papers gray literature, uh, blogs and, and Wikipedia articles. So there's a lot of that. So when you, so I, I have seen research, research papers come in with their references being 80%, the bottom two categories, and I'll just send it back and say, you know, you need to do a real literature review. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna There's skip. There's a couple of questions, Joel. Oh, okay. Um, you. Can you see them or would you like me to? Um, sample size. Um, okay, Larissa, let me, so could you expound on the question a little? Sure, yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, we obviously have access to certain participants, but I'm wondering if ICF has any kind of mechanism to expand that um, and tap into audiences that we might not necessarily be connected to. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, this, I'll, I'll just give you a preview um, for what I have farther along. And that is we have internally, we call it our research panel. So we've got about 5,500 coaches who may or may not be ICF members, but they have checked the box in, the, in their profile that says they're willing to help with research. And so we will go out to those folks at, a, at most frequently once every two weeks, and we will ask if they're willing to, to help out with research. And we have a, a specific format to our emails that go out. Uh, we, tell them who the person is, what university or place that they're associated with, what the study is about, and then the inclusion criteria. So, you know, they have to be a coach, coaching teams, for example, and then they're being asked to fill out a survey that might take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or they might want 
to have them do interviews, something like that. And then we always give the contact info for the person. And, and at that point, um, it's all up to the researcher. You know, we, we, we kind of step back, but we do vet those fairly rigorously. We will look at their, their interview guide. We'll look at their survey. Um, there are some that we've said, sorry, we're not gonna go out with that because we don't feel uh, it's rigorous enough and you're kind of wasting people's time. We don't want that. So um, we have that that we offer as a service for free to anyone who, who comes. And there's Thank a form you, you have to fill out. Yeah, where, where can we find out more from the other uh, side? So from the kind of researcher side and what you're looking for as far as you know, interview guides, et cetera, to, and the process of how long it takes, et cetera. Is there further information on the site? Um, there is on the website. Um, and what would they? Uh, we'll just, we can just go there. Um, or we can, I can maybe connect with you otherwise. Yeah, I, I'm always not. happy. I'm always okay. happy to meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you go to research, academic research, and then, um, I'm sorry, it's research assistance that got moved. Okay. And then you can click on this and here's, uh, here's the form and you'll be taken to a form. Okay. And you, you do have to answer a fair number of questions. So um, what, guess what the start is? What question is your research <laughs> trying to answer? And then what's unique? What are you trying to build on and so forth? So okay. what, ha Perfect. what happened was when I arrived was there was a lot of stuff coming in that wasn't research and I was wasting a lot of my time. So. And sorry, maybe just one last really quick question. What's the typical timeline for you to, so let's say we fill that form out and you receive it. What's the turnaround? I know you said every two weeks you're sending something out, but what's mm -hmm. the turnaround time typically? I guess so it depends. We try to respond to those within a week. Um, sometimes it may take a couple of weeks for us to really look at them. Um, and then, you know, at one extreme, somebody came in, uh, had their, they attached their survey. I mean, it was great. Had a, I had one phone call with a person who said, okay, we're ready. Um, we'll draft an email for you. You can um, let us know if that's okay. And boom, we can queue it up to go out in a couple of weeks. So, you know, the quickest it might be is a month, um, but sometimes the queue gets kind of full and we're full evaluating and then also um, we may have some in line and it could take as much as, I, well, there have been some that have taken a year because of, of the person didn't, yeah, they, well, I, I won't go into it, but you know, we you we'll work much. with people. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the other question was, ah, this is an excellent question, Lynn, not having access to a library. So, um, in the US, if uh, what I can do is I no longer, well, I have access to one university that I teach at, um, but they don't have the biggest um, set of literature. So I go there first um, and then there's a, a local state university in town. And a lot of the state universities as part of their charter, they need to allow access to the resources to anyone. So if I go sit in the library at the University of Kentucky, they have a huge collection and I can get access to that, to that collection as a guest. That's one way. Another way, if you can get a, a ResearchGate account, I think it's researchgate.net, um, a lot of the authors in there will either have their material posted or um, they'll say, email me um, which is what I do, and then I'll send it to you because the agreements that we sign as, as authors for copyright, we're turning the copyright over to the company, to the journal or to the book company, but um, we're allowed to send out on a onesie twosies basis the, the actual paper. You can, well, I won't go into that, but anyway, um, if you can get access um, to a, a state 
sponsored school. I'm not sure in other countries which folks can do, like in the UK. Um, the other thing is if you can find a friend who is getting a degree, that's always helpful too. Oh, I hesitate to say this, but there's a thing called Sci-Hub. If you Google Sci-Hub, uh, S-C-I-H-U-B, um, it's, I believe it it's, um, was founded by some Russians. If you have the DOI, the, I don't know, doc, document object identifier or something like that. If you put the DOI in Sci-Hub and it's now hosted in Sweden, you can get almost anything. I hate to say that, but <laughs> it's true. Okay, uh, does that help, Lynn? Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, we're gonna skip the question. Um, so you can get on our website, um, we've done some supervision uh, research. We, we did literature reviews. Um, we have stopped doing those because I don't think many people were reading them and it wasn't, it ended up not being a good use of our time. Um, but uh, there's a lot of material there. Here's some white papers um, referring a client to therapy. We've gotten some really good reviews on that. <clears throat> the coach approach to managing and leading. One of the things we try to do is publish an academic paper and then publish a companion white paper. So people who have a hard time reading the academia laden material, then it's more accessible. Um, the bottom one is a recent piece. Um, we've been working on uh, our um, artificial intelligence coaching. And so we got some, we've got some stuff uh, coming in that realm. So I wanna talk about the research portal. So this is another way um, that you can have access to research and um, researchportal.coach, well, it'd be coachingfederation.org, coachfederation still works. Um, and then there's a, some FAQs there. So this was one of the first things I did when I, I came into ICF, they said, hey, you know, can you revamp the portal? And we've got um, over 2,500 references in here. And we have uh, some of the pieces are in here as well. So we have a basic search and we have an advanced search. And here's the advanced search. So you can put in like team coaching organizations um, and you can say where you want to see that. And then you'll see the pieces will come up uh, in there and, you, and then um, you'll see this button that says view stream. And that's the unique feature. I gave this idea to Google about 20 years ago. They ignored it, um, but they could have done this, but now we're trying to get a patent on it. Um, so here's the paper that was uh, cited. And what you'll get when you click on view stream is you'll get the references in the left-hand column and you can scroll through those. You get the citations in the right-hand column. So I talked about the importance of being able to look at subsequent research on a paper. And now this only has the material that is in the portal. So um, in, in this, for this particular piece, we have 27 citation citing documents in the portal. And then you can also click on display bib tech uh, or display risk. So these are reference um, ways to compile your references and put them in a reference manager. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about that um, or if you want to follow on session. But I highly, highly recommend everyone using a reference manager program. This is a way to organize your references. I've got almost 10,000 references in mind. Um, most of the literature that I see that people have that I'm interested in, I have it now. I'll at least have a reference. And most of the time, I also have the piece itself. So it's a way to amass a lot, a lot of research on your own without having to, to go back to the library. So this is our academic research page. Um, here's me, here's Sarah. Um, she is in the process of getting her PhD on coaching culture. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, we also have Dave Jammons on our team, who's a newly minted uh, industrial and organizational psychology um, grad uh, at the master's level. 
We also use some contractors. We use a company called hum, Humro, Human Resources Research Organization, and then uh, a fair number of independent contractors that we, we uh, work with one-on-one. -on -one. So our goal of our team is to inform ICF strategy and policy, and there are some, some things beyond that. But sort of our vision is to take the, the one on one-to-one -on -one core competencies are the core of what we've done. And then, you know, we've taken that, you may have seen our team coaching competencies. So those are built on top of the core competencies. We used our managers and leaders uh, using coaching skills work that was also based on the core competencies. We're actually in the process of redoing that for the updated competencies. And then supervision, you know, looking at how does that fit into with the core competencies and then we're, we're looking at coaching culture. So in an organization, the coaching culture is sort of, my view is the heart of it, it's the center. And then all these other pieces are built around that. So we have several studies going on, I won't. I won't go into that. So here's some policies that we have. Those are on the, the website. You can find those. I want to talk real, real briefly about coaching culture. So what we did was, um, so research questions. Um, what does it mean to have coaching culture in an organization? Um, what influences that? How can it be defined? Um, and then what are the characteristics? And, and that's what we have have work, been working on. So um, these are the elements that we've done. We've done a literature review. We've done coding of that literature and found the elements. We created a taxonomy of how to categorize those elements. And what we ended up with were characteristics of coaching culture and then values of coaching culture. We did a survey using a max diff technique. I'll, I don't have time to go into that right now. But then from that survey, we found what do people feel are the most important of these elements of the characteristics and of the values. And then our next phase that, oops, that we're working in now is to um, develop assessment items on what an organization promotes and what is the coworker behavior. So we're gonna juxtapose these two. What is the organization promoting in terms of, say, openness in, in meetings? And um, then what are the coworkers exhibiting? What kind of behaviors in, ter in terms of openness in meetings? So there's a lot of value around that. We'll, um, we'll put that out, we'll test that and, and work with that. So I've talked about research assistance, that's, uh, and I'll give these slides to Lily and, da and Damien so you'll have all this. Here's where you go for that. I showed you that. There's also the uh, science of coaching uh, community of practice that you can attend. And there are several others, but uh, uh, yeah, I think these are the current Larry Boyer and Tunda Burdash. In terms of resources, uh, the APA style manual is extremely important. I found the, the Purdue, and I, I, I am biased because I have a degree from Purdue, but <laughs> actually this is, this is the one that pops up a lot. And they have an online writing lab and they have a very concise description of what it, need, what it means to be in APA format. Um, Google Scholar should be your friend. It's scholar.google.com. That will, have, um, will help you immensely with your literature search. And then I've already mentioned uh, ResearchGate. Here are a few books um, that are important. The APA publication manual is extremely important. Not, to, not only does it tell you how to put your references in APA style, but it talks about different kinds of studies. It talks about case studies. It talks about qualitative research, quantitative research, what it means to be rigorous, how to set your, your article up in terms of your tables and, and your figures. In terms of uh, qualitative coded, the Saldana book is, is very popular there. I think it's on the seventh edition now, maybe. Um, this price, Psychometric Methods, is pretty good. Um, the research design book got by Creswell is fairly good. If you want to create a scale, I point people to the Develos 
book, the scale development book, it's, it's one of the better ones out there and it's, it's pretty thorough. Um, more URLs and you'll have our emails. So we have eight minutes for more questions. That's the whirlwind tour. Thank you, Joel. It was pretty comprehensive as a whirlwind. <laughs> Any questions, comments, thoughts that you'd like to add to the conversation? And, and myself, Sarah, Gage, we're all open for to discussions. If you have questions about um, everything from research topics to how do I develop the surveys? Does the survey look good? Um, what about my interview guide? Do you think it's okay? Um, we've gone over those with fine tooth combs. Um, so we'll, we'll help people with those kind of activities as well. Lynn? Yeah, just one other comment as I'm reflecting on this. Um, I think that it's important to remember that even a small question can be really valuable. At the beginning, you talked about increasing the stream of data. And, you know, we don't have to boil the ocean. We can just add a little piece to what's known. And that can be really valuable because I think the whole prospect of doing a research project can seem daunting if it's, we think it has to be really huge. Yeah, I think that's a, an extremely important point, Lynn, um, because, and, and I'm one of the ones who want to boil the ocean, <laughs> I will confess. Um, and part of that is wanting to be rigorous in the process. But you can, you can take a very focused and very narrow um, topic. You can do a very, you know, pointed survey and you can get some really extremely valuable information that will expand the field. Yeah, absolutely. So I thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and if you note know the hierarchy that Joel had, academic journals are at the top and that's not what we're aiming for, right? So it doesn't need to be that as, as rigorous as to be published in a journal. Yeah, I, I have found, and, and you, you folks who've also done uh, publishing, uh, that I can get away with more uh, license to be philosophical in book chapters than I can in, in academic articles. <laughs> I don't know if uh, others would agree with that, but that's been my experience. Um, so Larissa, was this a question? Oh no, that was just, I was just echoing Lynn's uh, comment. And when we did our breakout group, you know, there's lots of topic areas that have very little or no research. So just remembering mm -hmm. that like around, especially around supervision. So it's a good reminder. Yeah, we, we started a, a pretty comprehensive supervision project last year and, and we've had to put it on hold for other reasons. Um, but um, we want to get back to that. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that, that could be researched. Um, I'll put one out here right now, and that is um, uh, language style, what's called LSM or language style matching. So what is the correlation of how much a coach matches the style, a language style of the client, um, how much of that translates into a uh, positive coaching outcome? I think that'd be a phenomenal study. And then, pair, then take it to supervision, mm -hmm. like the next level. <laughs> and then supervision of supervision. <laughs> well, yeah, how, how, you know, I always think of the turtles all the way down, right? Yes, okay. <laughs> Who supervises the supervisor? Exactly. That's the topic we're talking about in our community now. All right, oh. any last thoughts, comments before we let Joel go on and we all get on with our days, evenings? Just... Super appreciative to you, Lily and Damien, and of course, Joel for setting us up. It was great. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Really appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for coming out. Our yeah, next thanks. regular meeting is October 18th. We're talking about uh, how to use loyalty as a catalyst for self-reflection and supervision. So hope you can make it then.
Mm, that sounds we'll good. see you all then maybe i like that yeah thanks, thanks for, so much. thank you for your interest think of topics for your next book chapter <laughs> thanks everybody